today to listen to Galatians. So open, if you would, your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Lord willing, we're going to finish this out this morning. Listen, as you're looking for Galatians 5, I'm going to just give you a little warning up front. I will never apologize for what the Word of God says. It's the Word of God, and I will never apologize for that. I may apologize for my delivery of it if I uh, don't tell the truth tempered with love. But listen, the most loving thing I can do as a pastor is to tell you the truth. And the truth is that the study we're going to embark on this morning is a little unusual. Uh, It may be scary even to some of you. It may be scary to some who are listening to this online. But I would rather it scare you now and wakes you up then you wake up from the sleep of death and find yourself standing before the great white throne judgment, realizing that you had been deceived into believing you were saved in the first place. Now, we've already established, don't get too nervous, that once you are saved, you are saved. But what if you have been lulled in to a false sense of security, believing you're saved? You know, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian believers, believers, Those who believe they're saved, but they were showing up drunk to the communion meal, right? Which was just one of the many problems they dealt with in Corinth. And so Paul tells them, examine yourselves, test yourselves to see if you're of the faith. Because the way they're acting, there wasn't any evidence, there wasn't any fruit that they were saved. There wasn't any fruit that they had a new life in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to write to them, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So if the persons that he's addressing were genuinely of the faith, if they were believing Christians, there would be evidence of that, right? There would be fruit of that. Because Jesus lives inside of us. There has to be evidence of that. There would be evidence that the Holy Spirit was working within them sanctifying them, leading them, guiding them. But if their lives showed no evidence of all, at all of the Holy Spirit's activity in their lives, then Paul's saying, Jesus may not be within you. He may not be in you. You may not be saved. You, you failed the test. You're not of the faith. And we're going to read some very scary verses today. If they convict you, Feel blessed because the Holy Spirit's working in you to teach you. If you're offended, be warned because the Holy Spirit is also trying to tell you something. And you need to heed his warning. So buckle your seatbelts this morning because this ride might get a little bumpy. And listen, I take no joy in, in teaching these verses. This is what the Lord put on my heart to teach this morning. And maybe someone's here this morning or listening online that really needs to hear these words. So we're going to teach the truth and see where it takes us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So, Lord, we lift this study up to you this morning. I pray, Lord, that everyone would, you would meet us all where we're at here today, that everyone would take away from this message what you need them to take away from it. And, Lord, I pray that you would just do a mighty work through your word here today. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. So Paul obviously is describing the battle between our flesh and the Spirit, a battle that goes on daily in, in the life of a believer. A battle that he struggled with as well. Because listen to what he wrote to the church in Rome. He said, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. Does that struggle sound familiar to anybody in this room today? And in the next few verses, Paul's going to describe those who are living in sin. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's describing a believer saved by grace, but is still a flawed human being. How many flawed human beings do we have here this morning? 
Some of you. It's nice to be in the presence of perfection for the rest of you. Thank you. <laughs> Joey says you're welcome. <laughs> I think Sienna would disagree with you. <laughs> We've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we're perfect in spirit, right? But we're still struggling with imperfection in our flesh. To put it simply, we all sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the closer we walk with Jesus, the less we may struggle with sin. And as long as we're here on this earth, as long as we're living in these bodies of flesh, we will never be sinless. And the key to this struggle between the flesh and the spirit is to walk in the spirit so that we don't give in to the desires of our flesh. Every believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit the moment they come to faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's given to us to help us in our walk. That's his ministry on this earth. He's our helper. He's our comforter. He's our teacher. He's our guide. And having him in our lives is a sign that we are saved. Because Paul wrote, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So when we desire to walk in the Spirit, He helps us to avoid the obstacles that our flesh always puts in our way. So how do we walk in the Spirit? To walk in the Spirit means that we yield to His control. We follow where He leads us and we allow Him to influence, have influence over us. So what does that look like in practice? Well, listen, there's no doubt that what consumes our thoughts consumes us, right? I mean, what is the first thing that you think of when you open your eyes in the morning? Is it work? Is it all the appointments you have scheduled for the day? Is it the things you, all the things you must do? Is it the kids, the house, the car, the finances? What is it? What floods your thoughts from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed at night? I venture to say it's not Jesus. And I don't say that in a critical way because we're probably all guilty of that. I would venture to say it's not the Holy Spirit controlling your life. It's not the first thing that comes to mind when we wake up in the morning. But what we need to do is try to redirect those thoughts. To make it the first thing we think of. That instead of thinking of the busyness of our day, we redirect our thoughts to how the Holy Spirit can help and guide us and lead us through our day. Listen, when he speaks... That still small voice. We are to listen and obey. We are to be open to wherever and whatever he leads us to go or, or tells us to do, even if it doesn't fit the plan for our day. We're to rely on him in all that we do. He leads, we follow. He speaks, we listen and heed his warnings and obey his direction. So the keys to walking in the spirit are following him, submitting to him, listening to him, and obeying him. And the more you put him first in your life, the more he's foremost in your thoughts, the more you're going to yield to his leading. And the smoother your day may go. But bear in mind, we can and often do quench that work. We quench the Holy Spirit in our lives by giving in to the desires of our flesh. That word quench carries with it the idea of throwing a, a pail of water on a fire. And nothing quenches the work of the Holy Spirit in our life more than us giving in the desires of our flesh because it is like taking a bucket of water and just throwing it on that fire. One moment you're on fire for the Lord, and the next moment you're just doused in water. Fire's out. So make obeying and leading the God, lead, the leading of the Holy Spirit, a priority in your daily life, and you will avoid giving in to the desires of your flesh. So what are the works of or desires of the flesh? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because Paul outlines them in verses 19 and 21. And here's where the ride gets interesting. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, 
that those who do such things will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not my words, Paul's words. Most of these sins of the flesh are self-explanatory, so we're not going to go through them, but I want to point out a couple of them that you may not be familiar with. Sorcery. It's not casting spells. That word in Greek is pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from that word, so Paul's talking about addictions. Enmity is another word we don't often hear or use, but it means hatred or hostility. And the last word I want to point out is rivalry, which means selfish ambition. But the key to what Paul says here is when he says, I warned you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the, the ESV, which is what I read from, says those who do such things, right? The NIV, the nearly inspired version, says those who live like this. The NLT, anyone living that sort of life. And the New King James says those who practice such things. So if you were to take a real hard look at your life and examine your life, and you're still living like this. You're still practicing these things, these sins. Then you may have failed the test of faith. You may not be saved. You may not be of the, of the faith. And I know that's hard to hear. It's hard to say. But it's needed because it's not said. It's not talked about in church today. And that's why we have problems in the church today. In our text today, Paul's contrasting how a non-believer lives to the life of a believer. But it goes much deeper than that. It is a difference between light and darkness because followers of Jesus walk in the light and those practicing sin are still walking in the darkness, as John points out. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. It's a difference between life and death because those who are in Christ are alive in Jesus and those who are still practicing sin in their life are still dead in their trespasses and sin. So the question for us this morning becomes this. Can someone live a life of sin, the way Paul describes here, and still believe they're saved? Maybe you even know someone like that. I believe that people can and do still live like the world and believe they're going to heaven. Paul writes something very similar in his letter to the Romans. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, to get of approval of those who practice them. In Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32. He wrote it similar to, to the church in Corinth. For do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians <coughs> Chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Now bear in mind, Paul's writing these letters to believers in Galatia, Rome, and Corinth. Why would he write this if he wasn't concerned that there were those in the church who believed they were saved, who believed they were made righteous, but were still living as the unrighteous? They were still living as non-believers. Listen, we're all sinners. So I don't want you to think too highly of yourself before you leave here this morning. We're all sinners. Paul points out the key in these letters is those who practice these things, right? Those who continually live like this. That word practice in Greek is parasso. And that word means to perform repeatedly, habitually. But he goes on to write in Corinthians, he said, And as such, so were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So there's a distinct difference here. We are all sinners. But once we come to Jesus Christ, we're washed clean of that sin. 
and we're, sa- we're being sanctified. We're in the process of sanctification. But that's when the battle begins, doesn't it? We battle not wanting sin to defile our lives on this earth after we've been washed clean. And that battle that we all face, we all struggle with, is evidence that you are saved. However, if someone belongs to Jesus Christ and is continually living in the flesh, you need to reevaluate your relationship with Jesus. Because true believers no longer practice those things. We've begun a new life in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We've put off our old sinful nature. And we've put on the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ doesn't live in sin. And it doesn't practice such things. But sadly, many today believe that it's okay to live the way they were living before Jesus, even after they've made a commitment to follow Jesus. And part of that reason is they're not experiencing judgment for their sin, right? They're not getting hit by a lightning bolt every time they do something wrong. But they wouldn't experience judgment for their sin. Not now. They will experience judgment for that sin at the great white throne judgment. But then it will be too late. It will be too late to find out. Believers don't experience judgment for their sins. We are chastised. Personally, God doesn't let me get away with anything. Every time I try, he smacks me right in the head. (laughs) So God shows his love for us by chastising us. But if you don't belong to him, you're not going to be chastised by him. So you could wrongly believe that a lack of judgment from God is his approval for your lifestyle. And I saw a post on Facebook the other day that I had to respond to. I don't normally respond to these things because... You can get in a lot of trouble. But the question was asked, what do you expect me to do? You told me to love my neighbors, to model the life of Jesus, to be kind and considerate, and to stand up for the bully. And it goes on and on and on. But then he says, but now you call me a libtard, a queer lover. You call me woke, a backslider. You call me a heretic, a child of the devil. You call me a snowflake, a socialist. Now, the impetus behind this post was to elicit sympathetic feelings from Christians, to get Christians to feel guilty about them speaking out against the woke agenda. Now, I don't condone any of the vocabulary that was used against this poor guy in this post at all. I don't condone any of us using that vocabulary. But please understand, this post was designed to get a response, like the one Christian who did respond, love the sinner, hate the sin. I hate that saying. I hate that saying. By the way, and I'm not going to share that verse with you, look it up. I think it's Psalm 5, if I'm not mistaken, right, John? (coughs) Psalm 5 tells us the exact opposite of what I just said. Look that up. But this prompted me to respond by saying this. We're not talking about love the sin or hate the sin here. Churches that have become woke celebrate sin and do not speak of repentance. When Jesus ate with the tax collectors and sinners, he wasn't condoning or celebrating their sin. He was talking to them about repentance. That was his whole message to the world. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Paul points out in Galatians 5 that if you continue to live in your sin, you will not see heaven. Yes, we are to love people, but we are not to condone or celebrate their sins. A Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, is to put away our old life and become a new creation in Christ Jesus meaning we should no longer be living in or celebrating our sin, but walking in the Spirit. The most loving thing a Christian could do is tell someone practicing a life of sin is that they need to repent, turn from that lifestyle, and turn to Jesus and become a new creation in Him. That saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, has led the church to where it is today, where churches put up rainbow flags and sin is allowed to flourish and grow within their walls. Churches today don't preach about sin or repentance, which has lulled many into thinking that they're free of sin and they no longer need to repent. And that produces a license to do whatever you feel is right, that you can live as you always lived before because there's no need for you to change. And it has led many 
people believing that they are a believer in Jesus Christ and they can continue to live their life in sin. They believe they're saved, but they've been deceived. They've been deceived. What we're seeing in the church today is what Jeremiah saw in the temple that caused God to warn the people. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their direction. In other words, they're not speaking from God. They're just doing whatever feels right to them. My people love to have it so. So what will you do when the end comes? Listen, no matter what your church teaches, no matter what they don't teach, it's your responsibility to know the truth. It's your responsibility not to be deceived. So now that you know the truth, what are you going to do about it? Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. I promised you some scary <coughs> verses, and now I'm going to deliver. These verses scare the bejesus out of me when I read them. And they should elicit the same response from all of us. Again, once saved, always saved. I'm not saying anyone here is not saved. I'm talking about, and we all know people who continue to live the way they always lived, but believe they are saved. <laughs> so Luke chapter 13, verse 22. He, meaning Jesus, went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Wow. That's a million-dollar question, isn't it? This is Jesus' reply. Strive, meaning work hard, to enter through the narrow door. For many, that's a key word, many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, you will begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. You know, my mother used to say that to me all the time. I don't know where you came from. But I... <laughs> I think this has a different meaning here, though. But notice they called Jesus Lord. They believed they were saved. They believed Jesus was their Lord. But Jesus corrects them. He calls them workers of evil, meaning their flesh was their Lord. Matthew records Jesus as saying, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. But those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. In Greek, that word many means most. Most. Meaning most people, Jesus says, sadly, most people will find themselves on the path that leads to destruction. Most people will find themselves in hell. And to answer that person's question, Lord, will those who are saved be few? The answer is yes. That word few in Greek means puny, means little. Only a remnant will be saved. And if that's not scary enough, he says something even scarier. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, again, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen to what he's saying. They call him Lord, Lord. They believe they were his followers. They even did works in his name. Maybe they went on missions trips. Maybe they shared the gospel. They read their Bible. They went to church. They did all the things a believer would do, but they missed the most important thing. They never surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. They were never filled with his Holy Spirit. So Jesus tells them he never knew them. They were never his. But how could someone be so deceived? There's two things we need to pay attention to here. First, who are these people that say, Lord, Lord? These people obviously believe they were saved. They did and said what every believer does and says. But Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows our motives. And he's going to say to them, I never knew you. 
because you never knew me as Lord. That word Lord means we've given our lives to him. He is the Lord of our lives. Our flesh is no longer the Lord of our life. He is the Lord of our life. Instead of doing the will of God in heaven, they said, my will be done. And Jesus calls them workers of evil. In Luke and in Matthew, he calls them workers of lawlessness. Meaning they weren't following the, the commandments of the Lord. They were practicing the deeds of the flesh. Second, what is the will of our Father in heaven? Some men had come to Jesus once with a question, and they asked him, what does God require of us? In other words, what's God's will for our lives? And they said to Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me. So God's will for us is to have faith in his Son. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 says, and this is his commandment, that we must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Remember, there are those who will call him Lord, Lord in the end. And he's going to say, I never knew you. So what's missing in their life? What's different in their life that is complete in our life? What's missing is that if you're truly born, again, if you're truly born into the faith, if you're truly, a, a member, if you're truly of Jesus Christ and he's your Lord and Savior, you're going to produce good works to the glory of God. There's going to be fruit in your life. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A true believer will have the works of the Spirit manifested in them and through them, not the works of the flesh. Those who practice, and again, that word practice is key. Are you living like this? Is this your lifestyle? Those who continue to live a life of sin are not doing the will of our Father in heaven. They're doing their own will, what they will. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. They called him Lord, but they never knew him as Lord because they never submitted their lives to him as Lord. And as a result, he never knew them as his own. And this is going to be their fate. They will be cast into a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. So they will not as Paul says, inherit the kingdom of God. And that should elicit some response from us. First, it should break our hearts that there are people in this world that could be that deceived. And it should fill us with an urgency to tell them the truth. And second, it should scare us enough to have a healthy fear of God and to search our hearts daily to see if there's any wickedness in us. Just as David wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there are any grievous way in me and lead me on the path of everlasting. So don't let the enemy deceive you into believing that you could be saved and continue to live the way you did before you committed your life to Christ. Because the plain truth of the matter is, you can't. We can't. We cannot live like hell and expect to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So what are the good works that are produced in the life of a believer that we should walk in them? So the works or the fruit of the Spirit. And the first key is they're not our works. They're His works. The only works that have any eternal significance is the work that the Spirit does in us and through us. Anything we do in our flesh for the kingdom of heaven is going to be wood, hay, and stubble. So the fruit of the Spirit are as follows. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So those who are of the Spirit have the same nature of the Spirit, meaning the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in the life of every believer. What Paul gives us here is the fruit, is the fruit that a follower of Jesus is known by, right? It distinguishes a follower of Jesus from a non-believer because it's the fruit that's manifested in us through the Holy Spirit that helps us to know that the Holy Spirit's working in us. So Paul lists the attributes of a godly life, a life led by the Holy Spirit, which is in contrast to the attributes of an ungodly life led by the flesh. And so these nine attributes come together in a Christian's life to reflect a complete picture of the character of Christ. And what does Jesus say? 
They will know that you are mine by your what? By your fruit. So the first fruit is love. And it's the first fruit for a reason. In Greek, the word love that Paul uses for love here is agape love. Agape love is the kind of love that God has for his creation. It's a pure, selfless, self-sacrificing love. It always seeks the best for, for others, even for our enemies. It's a beautiful description of love. And, and, and the most beautiful description of this type of love is found in 1 Corinthians 13. The best example of agape love is when God showed his love for us by sacrificing his only son for our sinful nature. Paul wrote to the Romans, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's that type of love that enables us to demonstrate the rest of the fruit of the Spirit that we're going to read about this morning. Second is joy. The joy Paul refers to here is deeper than a sense of joy or gladness that comes from our circumstances, right? It's a profound delight. It's a rejoicing that comes from knowing that we're serving the God of the universe. In fact, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, we read that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Peace, number three, is an unshakable calmness, a peace even in the storm. It's a peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. Paul describes it as a peace that's beyond understanding. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number four, patience or forbearance. Also, maybe long-suffering in your translation. Patience is something I pray for every day. And it is in short supply in this world where everyone wants what they want when they want it, right? You remember popcorn? Jiffy Pop? You used to have to put it on the stove? It took forever to pop. Forever. Now you put it in the microwave, it still takes forever. Yes, that's forever, Lewis. In the world we live in today, that's forever. Paul wrote, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Number five, kindness or compassion. The fruit of the Spirit, this fruit of the Spirit, is a natural result of love. When God's Spirit begins to develop in a Christian's heart, treating others with kindness, compassion, and forgiveness is what follows. And so once that foundational fruit of love is flowing through a believer's life, not only kindness, but also gentleness, patience, and goodness, and all the other attributes listed here in Galatians 5, naturally follow. Paul wrote, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God, just as in Christ God forgave you. Number six, goodness. This fruit of the Spirit involves action on the part of a believer. It encompasses living our life with good morals and motives, as well as doing good things for others. Producing the fruit of goodness is the mark of godliness in a believer. Paul will write in chapter 6 of Galatians, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Number seven, faithfulness, which includes trustworthy, loyal, constant, and dependable attributes. The Christian who produces the fruit of faithfulness embodies all of those things. Faithfulness is especially important to God because the Bible tells us without faith, we can't please God, right? Without our faithfulness, we can't please Him. So no matter what life brings, no matter what it throws at us, God expects His disciples to be unwavering in their faithfulness. James writes, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. James chapter 1, verse 12. Number 8, gentleness. The way a Christian engages with others is what the fruit of gentleness is all about. It's the ability to discern when to use a gentle word in a tense situation, especially when your first thought may be an unkind response or an unkind word. A believer who responds with gentleness is a true reflection of Jesus and the kingdom of God. 
Proverbs 15 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And the ninth one, self-control. And Paul concludes this list of fruits of the Spirit with self-control. Because of our sin nature, we can exhibit negative impulses, right? Especially when someone's doing it 20 miles an hour and a 45 mile an hour speed limit. <laughs> Overcoming those negative impulses can be a constant tug of war. Hence, his saying, for what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, I do. It's that tug of war between the spirit and our flesh. But believers have the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives to help us identify and overcome these areas of weakness. Because listen, we all struggle with all of these fruits, right? Mm -hmm. If we're honest with ourselves, we don't produce this fruit every day. But we have the Holy Spirit to help us if we just yield our lives to him. Paul wrote to Titus, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvations to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And again, an important note for us to remember is that it's his fruit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not ours. We don't produce fruit like this normally without his help, right? However, as believers, we have an important role to play in this. Verse 25, Paul reveals the secret of making sure the Holy Spirit can produce fruit in our lives. He says, live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. Keeping in step means trusting in Him, trusting in the leading of the Spirit. For a believer to discover the Spirit's leading, the Christian must be in a close relationship with God. You're never going to be led by the Holy Spirit if you're walking 50 miles away from Him. By spending time in God's presence and being immersed in prayer and His Word, you're going to develop a close relationship with Him, and you're going to learn to depend more upon Him. You're going to learn to yield to Him more than quenching Him. And the way we do that, again, is by following him, submitting to him, listening to him, and obeying him. By focusing our attention on him at the beginning of every day. And asking him to lead and guide us through our day. Asking him to help us produce the fruit that he has, that he can manifest through us. Help, help us produce that fruit during the day. Because Jesus told us, again, the world, they, the world, know us. Know that we're followers of Jesus Christ by our fruit. Verse 24 of Galatians 5. And those who belong to Christ Jesus has, has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. <coughs> so our old man, our sinful nature, has been crucified with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 tells us that. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. This is something, again, we are responsible to do. <coughs> Even though our sin was put to death on the cross as Jesus became our sin and exchanged his righteousness for our sin, our flesh will not be finally dealt with until we're resurrected. Until then, we must daily, sometimes moment by moment, crucify our flesh, put it to death. I love the way Martin Luther puts this. To resist the flesh is to nail it to the cross. Although the flesh is still alive, it cannot very well act upon its desires because it is bound and nailed to the cross. So our flesh is what keeps us from having the fruit of the Spirit manifested through us. If we nail it to the cross, meaning rendering it as dead to us, it can't interfere with that fruit production any longer. Verse 25. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, Paul uses two different Greek words for the word walk. In Galatians 5.16, that word he uses for walk is the same word we use for walk. It means walk. And it describes our spiritual walk with the Lord. But here in Galatians 5.25, the word walk, in some of your translations it says walk. Mine says keep in step with but that's exactly what it means. It means keep in line with or keep in step with. The idea is the Spirit's given us life 
Let him now direct our steps. Whereas one translation translates this verse, if the Spirit is the source of our life, let the Spirit also direct its course. And the way verse 25 is written, it's written in the present imperative, which indicates that this is to be our habitual practice. Surrendering our will and our life to let the Holy Spirit lead it. Yielding to Him should be our habitual practice. Because if we're walking in the Spirit, we're not giving in to the desires of our flesh. We can't serve two masters, can we? So decide today if you're going to continue to serve your flesh or serve God. Because, listen, whether we're prayerfully, no one in this room is continually living that way, as Paul describes. No one here, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, should be continually living that way. But we all lose that battle with the flesh from time to time, don't we? And so what I'm telling you is the, the secret to that, to losing, I hate to lose. So if you don't want to lose that battle with the flesh every day, then the way you do that is to give your, make sure that you're dedicating your life, that you're yielding your life to the Holy Spirit. And he'll help you win that battle with your flesh every single day. And so the question, what will you do in the end? We can serve the flesh. We can give in to the flesh. Or we can yield to the Spirit. What will you do in the end? And if you're here this morning or listening this morning, you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then some of those verses I read today are very scary verses for you. Very scary verses. And so if you want to give your heart to the Lord, it's as simple as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. The Bible tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The first step to salvation is admitting that we're sinners. God's a holy God. We're sinners, so that creates a problem for us. But God solved that problem by sending his only begotten, begotten son, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That in him, we would have eternal life. Because the wages of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So once we admit we're sinners, we need to re repent of that sin. Turn to Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for our sins. And that believe, brings us to be. The Bible says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. There are many who are going to stand before the great white throne judgment in shame, thinking they were saved, and they weren't. Thinking they could go on living the life they led before Jesus, and that this wasn't going to have any consequences, and it will. And as a pastor, I don't want to see anyone stand before him and come to that realization. No one that's, that's heard this message anyway. Because if you do, you have no one to blame but yourself. So you admit you're a sinner. Turn to Jesus, and here's the key. Call upon the name of the Lord. Confess that you can't do this on your own, that there's no amount of good works that you could do. And Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth, and here's the most important part of what you're going to hear this morning, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not enough to just say it. The words have no meaning whatsoever unless you make Jesus Lord of your life. And if Jesus is Lord of your life, there's no way you can live like this, as Paul describes, and not feel convicted. Not feel that sharp smack to the back of your head. You can't do it. And if you are doing that, that means something's missing. That Jesus isn't Lord of your life, but your flesh is the Lord of your life. You know, my pastor used to say all the time, there's no room on that throne for the two of you, for you and Jesus. Someone's got to get off of it. And that someone needs to be us. We need to allow Jesus to be Lord of our life and to rule our life. And we need to get out of the way and let him do what he does best. Amen?
So if that's you this morning, if you don't know the Lord, I, I implore you, I beg you, as time is drawing near, close, it is getting close. If you don't believe we're living in the last days, see me after service and we'll have a conversation. Time's drawing near. This is not the time to be sitting on the fence. This is not the time to be arguing with yourself as whether or not you should make a decision or not. And to be honest with you, for anybody here, no one here is guaranteed your next breath. For any of us, we could be waking up and looking upon the Lord, either seeing his face and hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, or standing in line at the great white throne judgment. The choice is yours. And I pray that everyone who hears this message this morning, if you don't know the Lord, that you make the right choice. Amen? Please stand. Thank you.